Hi, Sam from Pop Running Form. Welcome back to another episode. And today I'm interviewing my coach, uh, Dr. Megan Roach. She is the 2016 USCATF Women's Ultra Trail Run of the Year and Sub Ultra Trail Run of the Year. She's a four time national champion, North American mountain running champion, and a six time member of Team USA. She's also a coach for SWAP Running with her husband, David Roach. And she's also a doctor. Uh, she graduated from Duke University with a degree in neuroscience and has a medical degree from Stanford. And she's currently doing her PhD in epidemiology and actually doing some studies into um, the effects of the pandemic on runners as well. So we had a chat about that and a chat about training in general. So I really hope this will help you guys, especially those of you who don't necessarily have a a training philosophy or a training plan that you you work with that this will help you guys really form some fundamental understandings of how you can be a better runner and learn to improve your running for life so enjoy three two one hello how are you i'm good how are you megan good it's so good to see you i know it's been a while since we've had a, a proper chat it has been a while how's the bay area uh, it's going pretty well. Yeah, can't complain. Um, we have been doing a lot of uh, family outings with the kids, finding lots of new trails to explore and stuff. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's such a good way to do it this time. Yeah, yeah, we've got to burn their energy off somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so Create that... proper trail runners while you're at it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're becoming trail runners for sure. I think they're going to be willing to go once they've got the, the legs to keep up with the, the motivation. That's good. You're built base building from a young age. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so it's been a lot of fun. How about you? How's uh, you in Colorado at the moment? Yeah, in Colorado, it's really nice here. Um, you know, we have pretty good access to trails and mountains that are not crowded, which makes a big difference. Um, and kind of enjoying being an introvert at the moment. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a, a shock, I think, when things start opening up. And um, but you know, hopeful in terms of like supporting business small businesses and things like that that things will start opening up a little bit more soon yeah yeah has things been noticeably i mean i guess colorado ha doesn't seem like it's been hit quite as bad as the bay area no not as bad for sure i think in terms of the rest of the population we definitely have more cases than like average states but um not as bad as the bay area and so okay. things are opening up um a little bit actually i just got a notification that um the gym i go to is opening up which i was pretty surprised about sweet nice yeah yeah so um it's kind of crazy it's kind of hard not having any gym equipment to use at the moment as well i know i'm using like all these household objects i'm like taking things out from the refrigerator <laughs> and seeing what i can use <laughs> yeah i've done a little bit of squatting with my kids but then they're, they're not heavy enough <laughs> that was funny i need to <laughs> i need to feed them some more ice cream <laughs> yeah yeah exactly are you, you're an epidemiologist at the moment, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing an epidemiology PhD at the moment. Um, so I'm in my first year and it's kind of funny because when I started the epidemiology program, no one knew what epidemiology was. Even my dad was yeah. like, you're doing what ology? And now it's like become a highly relevant profession. So um, yeah. the frame of my first year PhD program has definitely changed quite a bit. Has it, yeah, so has it affected your work directly in many ways? Yeah, so actually a lot of the research that I'm doing right now is actually related to COVID-19 and athletics. Um, so looking at COVID-19 and like the zero prevalence in the athletic population and then try, trying to establish like fitness guidelines um, for high level athletes who are looking to like minimize risk of exposure to COVID-19, minimize risk of um, any like immune system issues or anything along those lines from overtraining. So um, it's been fun to do it in that way. Wow. So has it literally completely changed what you're studying right now for your PhD? Yeah. Um, well, I'm still, I'm still continuing a lot of the research. So I do a lot of like sports injury research, a lot of research in bone stress injuries in the collegiate population. So that stuff is still going on. I'm just picking up extra projects related to COVID-19. Okay. And yeah. what do you think the outlook is for us athletes in terms of like what our normal athletic lifestyles used to be? Oh, that's a it's a good question. It's honestly a million dollar question, and I think yeah. no one has no one has the answer for it, unfortunately. Um, yeah. You know, I think races are going to start opening up, and you know, there's some races right now in Utah, some races in Arizona, um, and I think it's just going to be hard to say what happens in terms of like major marathons and um, you know other bigger races. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to. I've seen that it looks like there may be some small trail races regionally, like here and there, that are that are still yeah. continuing to go ahead. So, 
I, I guess think, that's probably a good place to start. I th- yeah, I think so. I think trails are great um, because naturally people are farther apart. I think one one idea too is to have waves of participants. So to have, um, you know, yeah. not everyone start at once and do it based on time. Obviously yeah. limiting like nutrition and like some of the celebrations and parties after the fact too is helpful. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I guess we're all becoming a lot better at time trialing now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I, I tell athletes like some of the hardest workouts and some of the hardest race efforts actually come from individual time trials. Like running a solo 5k is one of the hardest things you can do as a runner. So athletes who have done that will be well primed to enter the the bigger racing arena. Yeah, I know. I just did that this morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how did it go? Wait, this is like a live, this is like a live training update. Yeah, it was, uh, it was hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you were, you were right. It did feel rough. Um, yeah, I, I mean, as you're just, since you're just building back into like some of these more intense workouts, it probably yeah. was a major shock to the system. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think I started out way too optimistic about what I was going to be able to hold. And then I paid for it for like the rest of the run. <laughs> okay. That must've so, been unpleasant. Yeah. No, I, I did think I wanted to quit a couple of times, but I kind of like, well, <laughs> it's not that far. I can do, I can get this done. So yeah. It serves as a great workout too, honestly. And, you know, a central governor day where you're just like remembering how to meter out pain, which is its own workout by itself. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good benchmark too. So I know what to expect for future efforts now. Yeah. Well, I imagine the, the 10K in this challenge will, should hopefully feel a lot easier than the 5K. Well, yeah, I guess I'll at least have to be a bit more sensible what pace I choose to go at. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Was it hot there today too? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I had to start a bit later because the kids had a really bad night's sleep. So oh, no. uh, it wasn't wasn't super cool, which isn't what well, I'm obviously used to early morning training. So yeah, yeah, the heat that is another element help. in that. Yeah, but it's not crazy today, which is nice. So. That's nice. That's nice. Anyway, let me uh, do a quick intro. I wanted to chat with you today because I'm passionate about helping people run healthily and happily for their life. Um, and so on my YouTube channel, I'm focusing on helping people to learn run, to run more efficiently through like technique primarily. But another big part of the equation is like training and like how to train and also a mental approach to running um, that's sustainable. So you've been my coach for three years and you also co-authored the book, The Happy Runner. And I thought it'd be great to hear directly from, from you as one of the experts on how to approach training with a healthy and positive outlook and make it something that sustains and grows for um, the, you know, for our lifetime if we want. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm talking to you today and hopefully we can share some of your wisdom with, with everyone who's watching. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited about this. Um, honestly, I learn a lot from you as a coach in terms of learning about the biomechanics, learning about um, different form techniques. And so I'm excited to learn from you in this process too. So I'm sure we'll go back and forth and um, yeah, excited to chat. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so let's start with a couple of quick ones um, that um, some of my friends were interested in, at the, just like about the current situation. So What's currently keeping you motivated and you think is helping keeping your athletes motivated um, to run week in, week out? Yeah, so right now the current situation is obviously really tough for a lot of athletes. I think um, with COVID-19 and not having races on the calendar, it can be difficult to get out to train. Um, And it really challenges athletes in terms of thinking about why they run. And I I actually think this is a great time to like sit down and think about those fundamentals of like what drives you to get out the door. For me personally, it's actually a love of nature. Um, You know, I just love being outside on the trails, being outside in the mountains. And it kind of like, it resets me for the day. Like, I think it makes me a better person. Um, And then in in addition to that, I think I just need the natural energy release from running again to be a better person, to be actually like a sane human being. And so I think that when I think about it that way, it really helps. But I think the final point on this too is, is that it's not always easy for me to get out the door to go for a run. Like I think, especially right now, um, without that motivation of having a race on the calendar um, and just being okay with that, you know, sometimes relying on on tools like music or friends or, um, you know, even just thinking about post-run pancakes. So it's okay if it's not easy to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you touched on a couple of key ones. There's like, Obviously, we love to get our endorphin hits uh, from the running. And also, obviously, we, we like eating. So you know, <laughs> running, running more means more eating, which is nice. 
<laughs> exactly. So. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great equation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the, is this something that you found for your athletes too? Yeah, I found that for my athletes. I think one thing with my athletes that I found is that voicing this and like voicing the struggle to get out the doors can sometimes be really helpful. Like whether that's on Strava, whether it's on social media, whether that's in the training log and just realizing that we're all going through this together. Like the entire running community right now is experiencing a foundational shift in daily habits, a foundational shift in how we approach training and really coming at that from a community standpoint is helpful. Um, and then also just using this as a time to get back to the basics. So thinking more about aerobic training, thinking about like working elements of play into training um, and not being afraid to do that and to try to find what brings joy um, because certainly it's helpful for, during this time, but will be also helpful in the long term as well. Definitely. So I guess that kind of touches on my next question, which is how, how has the current um, situation like with social distancing and, and so on affected your approach and other uh, people you train's approach to, to their running? Yeah. So the interesting thing about social distancing right now is it's kind of like the wild, wild west in terms of like restrictions and how they're varying based on geographic location. So um, I coach athletes across the world and some athletes are able to run in large groups just based on where they are in the local restrictions. And then some athletes are literally dodging police and like trying to sign in for different restrictions in terms of only being out for an hour on runs. Um, and so the experience is quite different across the world um, and certainly across the US as well. Um, what I'm encouraging athletes to do is just to be mindful of social distancing, to be mindful of the restrictions in their area. Um, and then if they can't get out to run with people, um, I've had athletes honestly who like talk to people um, on their AirPods as they run or who listen to podcasts or who have music. So like finding different ways to get around it and still find motivation depending on the restrictions and where you are is helpful. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. Awesome. Well, I wanted to take a step back because uh, a lot of people I imagine who are finding uh, my videos uh, might be quite new to running and may not have their own like specific approach to training or they might be open to new ideas on training as well. So I wanted to talk a lot about uh, SWAP. Um, so SWAP for those people who don't know is some work all play and that's the name of your, you and da your husband David's uh, coaching group. Um, and so SWAP has been around since what, 2013, is it? It's a good question. I think it's either 2012 or 2013, somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, and so you've been my coach for the last few years. So I wanted to talk to you about SWAP. And uh, so firstly, what, what, what is SWAP and why, why is SWAP? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, Swap is some work I'll play, as you mentioned, and um, we're a coaching group and we coach, honestly, a, a wide range of athletes. So anyone from professional trail runners to people who are um, heading to the Olympic trials for the marathon and the 10K, all the way to people who are just getting into running. So people who are working into a run-walk um, to people who are thinking about, you know, 100-mile races. So we really coach a, a range of people. And I think what we found through that process is that, treating everyone as an elite athlete is the foundation of what we do. So if you run, if you move your body, you're an elite athlete and kind of reframing that in your mind is fun to think about. Like it's fun to think about scientific approaches from anyone who's just starting out to running to the very top level. Um, and that's how we really approach it. And then, um, Beneath that approach is the, the understanding that we give unconditional support to everyone. So um, we really want to make sure that it's like a dialogue um, in terms of training and how life relates into that training equation between us and our athletes and that um, athletes feel unconditionally supported along the way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think like, yeah, definitely one thing which I would highlight, um, which is definitely my philosophy too, is like everybody should treat themselves as an elite athlete you know, uh, it doesn't matter that you're not necessarily running at like an elite level. Um, you know, the, if you approach training in the same way as an elite athlete, it's going to benefit you this in the same way. You know, you can't just, um, say, well, okay, I'm not an elite athlete. So that doesn't, that means I shouldn't take my training seriously. Absolutely. Yeah. I like, I like thinking about that mindset um in terms of the mindset itself and then also like all the little steps that feed into being an elite athlete. So I encourage athletes. It's like, 
hey, even if you have a really busy life, it's important to take the time to prioritize or to like weave things like um, foam rolling, stretching, you know, um, adequate protein intake, all of these little things into your life. So to fuel the machine, to fuel yourself, um, to power yourself as if you're an elite athlete. And then also the mindset too. Um, like simply believing that is a big step for a lot of people and, um, you know, can actually be helpful motivation for getting out the door when things are challenging. Yeah, great. So um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what the SWOT philosophy of, for training is. Um, I mean, you talked a lot about the mental mindset, and I think that's an important thing to touch on as well. Um, so how would you sort of like describe the SWOT philosophy from, from both the, the mental approach to also to the physical and daily training approach? Awesome. Yeah, so I'll start with the mental approach first, because that's the foundation. We've kind of already touched on that a little bit. Um, again, getting to those points that everyone is elite and truly just believing yourself in, in the long term. So everything that we do in SWAP is centered around the concept of like thinking about three-year goals as opposed to three-week or three-month goals and um, thinking about building that foundation over time. Um, because running it truly is one of those things that happens over time. It's about consistently getting out day in and day out um, and seeing those incremental gains over time. For athletes who are just starting out, sometimes those incremental gains um, happen over the course of three weeks. Um, but for people who are a little bit more seasoned, sometimes it takes three years to see, to like truly see those incremental gains. So that's like the mental side of it in a very, in a very quick synopsis in terms of the like the underlying um physical training element of what we do um we focus a lot on building the aerobic base so just building a foundation of miles um and that can be different for a lot of people so for some people that's 20 miles a week for other people it's eight, it might be like 80 miles a week um so starting with that str strong foundation of aerobic fitness and then layering in speed on top of that so we we give speed to all athletes people who are beginners to people who are seasoned veterans um and a lot of that comes in the form of hill strides and shorter intervals, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, and then on top of that, layering in long runs. And that's kind of, that's kind of like the holistic training picture and it, it varies greatly based on each person. Sure. Um, so yeah, there's three key elements of like the swap training uh, in terms of the physical aspect, which, um, which I wanted to talk about a bit. Um, and then maybe we can also touch on the mental aspect again. But so can you tell us what is like, I know it's briefly mentioned in your book. I don't know if you're fully familiar with it, but the training salad. <laughs> That's funny because you had emailed me about this. And I, I actually turned to David in the kitchen. I'm like, did we write about the training salad? And he's like, I don't know. That was three years ago. <laughs> but I will briefly put together what I think is the training salad. And it may or may not be the same as what's in the book. It's been a little bit of time since I've seen the book. So the way I think about the training salad is um, you have the base. So like a salad base would be like romaine lettuce or spinach or like whatever the heck, whatever the greens are that you're putting in the salad. And yeah way that I view that is the aerobic base. So like you're really building that strong foundation of miles. Then layered on top of the salad are all the like tasty things that make salad great uh, because romaine lettuce by itself is kind of terrible. Um, so I think about like, you know, the croutons, um, the vegetables, the things like that as lactate threshold or tempo work. So really building um, that engine. And then the extra tasty things, so the things like bacon bits and, and salad dressing and all that good stuff that you should use sparingly, but that add a lot to the overall mix as is kind of like the vo2 max training so like the higher the higher end intensity um and that's how i would describe a training salad whether or not it's how i actually wrote it <laughs> <laughs> no i think that sounds that sounds about right to what i read so <laughs> i'm glad i'm glad it matches i was like oh my gosh it's been three years i can't remember writing about a training salad <laughs> <laughs> so i think like one thing that i took away from that is like the key part of it like the greens as you will like the majority of the salad is the easy pace right mm -hmm. and and just the consistency i guess you can't really have necessarily consistent greens in salad but like the consistency <laughs> of of doing easy pace runs is that yeah i i 100 agree and i think the key to that is making sure that easy is actually easy so i see a lot of athletes who are just starting out and i'm kind of 
I'm kind of a victim to this too, where sometimes my easy pace is not actually easy. I get excited. Um, so having a quantifiable way to define easy pace is helpful for a lot of people, um, especially athletes who may get excited. Sometimes that can be, you know, a heart rate monitor, especially chest straps, because sometimes I've seen that wrist sensors are not very accurate. Um, RPE or, or um, relative perceived exertion, essentially rating your effort on a scale of zero to 10. There's some other scales out there too that are used. Um, so those are two common metrics um, in terms of thinking about defining easy running yeah yeah definitely and for a beginner runner just doing easy pace runs consistently can yield like a lot of like really positive results and also not be too hard on your body exactly uh the way i like to think about it for beginner runners is that um, when you're just getting into running, it's really about establishing your musculoskeletal system and, and getting your body adapted to the demands of the pounding of running, um, which is so different than sports like cycling or swimming, where you don't have that pounding element. And easy runs are a great way to consistently achieve that without having the higher risk of injury. Um, and I'm sure you've talked about that in your, I mean, biomechanics are such an important part of, of building that up and, and keeping that musculoskeletal system strong. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so what about, uh, strides? So I noticed that there's a lot of talk in your book about, um, running economy and building running economy and the, uh, a key way to build this is to do a lot of strides. So what are strides and how do they help build um, running economy? So strides are a great concept. We actually, we give them to almost every single athlete in swap. Um, they can be anything from something like four by 20 second power hill strides all the way up to something that can like border a little bit more in the realms of a workout to like eight by 30 second flat ground strides um, or even like six by 45 second flat ground strides. So that's the, that's kind of the foundation of what they are. The key for strides is making sure that you're not doing an all out sprint. Um, so we're talking about kind of 70 to 75% effort, um, finding flow and making sure that it's not, um, you know, something that, that feels like your form is breaking down and that's the best way to adapt to it in the long term. The, the reason why strides are so effective um, is two reasons. Um, one being the, the neuromuscular demands. Um, so when you practice strides in that faster running, it feeds into running economy because you're training your neuromuscular system to move fast and to move efficiently. Um, and that helps increase the pace of your easy runs later on at the same effort. The second reason is actually cardiac stroke output. Um, so when you do strides, what happens is your heart rate um, you know, rapidly increases as you're building that effort. Um, and that feeds into something called cardiac cardiac stroke output, which is actually helpful for building as an athlete. Cool. And um, maybe you can also feed in like two questions in one here. So my, my primary question is how do you um, fit strides into a training schedule? But also just to make this a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word, concrete for people. I know that you've had success with athletes in the past who maybe even have like a big training background who have come in, come to you and not found the speed that they wanted. And just from adding strides into their schedule, they've been able to like hit breakthroughs. So can you talk about what kind of would you put into their schedule to make that happen and how that worked for them? Yeah. I love the two for one approach. This is efficient. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> efficiency for the win. So yeah. I, I often have athletes doing strides two to three times a week, depending on the athlete um, and also depending on kind of their workouts and long run structure. The way I like doing it is putting it generally towards the end of a run. So for example, if you have an eight mile run, um, doing six miles and then doing something like four by 30 second power hill strides, taking lots of recovery between strides so that your heart rate has time to come back down and so that you can, um, you know, you're not too fatigued as you start out each stride. Um, and again, yeah, working into those two to three times a week is great. What I like about strides too is that it doesn't add significant stress on the body um, in terms of effort, but also in terms of musculoskeletal stress. For high level athletes, um, what we've seen often in SWAP is that we have a lot of athletes who come to us who are speed limited. So they've been kind of churning out the aerobic base or maybe they've been hammering out the lactate threshold, but um, their, their top end speed isn't as good. And that top end speed really does translate across all pieces. And strides are a great way to work that top end speed to work the neuromuscular demands, again, without that high risk. Um, and so we see a lot of top level athletes who add them into their training um, and within three to four weeks are feeling way better than they were before. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's some really awesome examples of that in the book. Um, one of them that comes to mind was um, Andrew Skirka. Mm -hmm. uh, he did a, yeah. So can you talk about his experience? 
Yeah. So Andrew Skirka, he's, he's a good friend. He's actually living here in Colorado. Um, and he started working with David and she, I guess probably back in 2014, 2015, but Andrew Skirka is an amazing adventure hers. So he's, um, he's one backpacker of the year. He's done all of these epic adventure trips. So his engine is huge. His, um, you know, his ability to cover miles is massive, but what he was really missing was that top end speed. Um, and he was looking to run a fast marathon and David wove in some of these hill strides, some of these background strides into his training. Um, and Andrew Skirka, who has, again, been training for years, has this massive engine within three to four weeks, um, was seeing gains in his running economy, seeing gains um, in his easy pace at the same heart rate. So, and the cool thing about working with Andrew Skirka and the same thing about working with you, Sam, is that he's, um, Skirka is such a uh, data motivated person. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we were very easily able to see his gains in a short period of time, just because like all of his training over the last few years has been quantified. Yeah, yeah. And he dropped like nearly 20 minutes off his marathon time, right? Which was already yeah. like 2.45 or something. So. It was it was really impressive. I can't, I actually would have to ask David about his exact time, but it was fast. I know he ran like a 2.28 at, at Houston, which was amazing. So. Yeah, and it was, it was hot that year too. Yeah, yeah. I followed him on Strava while he was doing it. I was like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get to do a flat fast marathon one day and do something. I am, like I am really excited about that. You've chose, you've historically chose challenging marathons. So yeah, I know. <laughs> from I a coaching like standpoint, I'm looking for like a CIM. Um, I know. Yeah. I like the trail trailly type marathons, unfortunately, like the ultra running types marathons, but yeah, you're good some at fast, you're good at them. the fast one would be nice. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's nice to get one fast one in just to, just to kind of really go for it and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah um cool there's a lot there um so what advice would you generally have to like a, a new runner to uh, when they start running because i guess a lot of people get into running and they want to do like a half marathon or even just a 10k uh, and some might be really adventurous and go i want to do a marathon with not necessarily a big background and like a typical person might get a program off of you know a website which tells them do this structured workout flow etc um but that might not be the best long-term approach for them. So like what kind of approach would you generally advise for new runners who are interested in doing something like that? Yeah, this is, this is an exciting question. I think for new runners, my biggest recommendation is to keep it simple um, and to focus on frequency. So I think a lot of the, the training plans for new runners are very complicated in terms of like laying out all of these different ways that you could possibly get into running. And what I encourage most people is just to think about working up to four to five days a week of running and thinking about it more in terms of time on feet as opposed to mileage at first. So for very new runners, honestly, getting out the door for 15 to 20 minutes um, for four to five days a week is a great way to build that musculoskeletal system, to build the base. Um, and it's a less overwhelming way than saying like, oh my gosh, today I have to get out the door to run six miles and do X, Y, and Z. So I think establishing that frequency first and that four to five day spot is kind of um, the sweet spot in terms of thinking about about frequency and then you can layer in cross training from there um, and then once you have that base that's when it's fun to think about layering in the hill strides layering in some of the shorter intervals things like six by one minutes or five by two minutes um, mm -hmm. and then progressing into tempo from there so just keeping it simple at the start and um, making sure to reinforce an element of play and, and making it fun to get out the door yeah and that's one thing I do love about swap is um, I mean I always enjoy running but I like the um, the workouts that you often give are not necessarily overly taxing, you know, like you get sufficient recovery, but you do a lot of speed. So it's not necessarily like go and run a block of, you know, five by one mile repeats or something like that. It's more like run two minutes, you know, every five minutes hard and something like that. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think the big thing that we try to emphasize with our athletes is athletes adapt best to gradual stimuli over time with a little bit every once in a while throwing in a real real blaster of a workout in there but um you know the body really just responds to those consistent pokes over time rather than trying to slam it with a massive stimulus um mm. The other thing that we emphasize too is, you know, I've been a runner on the track before and showing up after a busy day at work, showing up after, you know, dealing with family demands all day and trying to hit something like six by one mile is just exhausting. So yeah. framing it in the terms of minutes is, is so much more helpful. Like six by five minutes sounds way better than six by one mile in my opinion. Yeah, that's true. Um, so yeah, I guess kind of that leads to another quick question, which is uh, how do you approach like someone's training load in the context of their life and you know what other stresses might be occurring in their life 
Yeah. So the way the way I coach is um, having a Google log um, where essentially it's part training and then there's like a big whole whole column dedicated to what's going on in life. And honestly, the training and the life feed in equally to how I create an athlete's overall training plan, because if you think about it, like we're all feeding the same bucket of stress, like, you know, staying up late with a kid who's, who's up late, um, is the same kind of stress that you experience from training at all. It all feeds that same bucket. So, um, it's pretty individual in terms of how I structure it. I have some athletes who are doctors and working night shifts and other athletes who are new parents. Um, so it, it really just becomes a week by week conversation, but I think whatever you're doing, whatever plan that you're, you're following, really just like taking a step back and thinking about how your life fits into it and being willing to modify is, is something that's so helpful for fitness going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. And like, it's something that you do. I have another friend who's got a, a coaching business and he's a doctor based in Australia and it's something he really focuses on as well, which is like making sure that he takes into account the whole context of their life when giving them a training plan and not just saying, okay, this is the training that's going to work for a marathon go do it regardless of your personal circumstances. Um, yeah, I think like you're making sure that if you do have like a stressful week that you, you know, with work or with family or whatever it might be, that you kind of deload the training a little bit that week so that you can handle that better. From my perspective as a coach too, I really like to set the dialogue early on that the training plan is a best case scenario and a best case scenario only. And that I, you know, I expect that athletes adapt and are flexible to what's on the training log. And that's the best way to reach consistency in the long term. But I think the concept of rest days too also feeds into that. I have all swap athletes take a, mostly it's a Monday rest day. Some athletes kind of sprinkle it and on other days. And um, I think that rest day creates a buffer where um, you're a little bit more protected against life stress and training stress and injury yeah yeah i think like consistency is important but recovery is also very important you know like you don't get better without recovering from your training exactly and the, honestly for me as an athlete that monday rest day is kind of sacred from a mental perspective like i find i wake up on tuesday so motivated to train um yeah. and i've gone through periods where i haven't taken the rest day and um training just feels a little bit more stagnant and not as fun yeah yeah no i can understand that for sure uh, let's talk about nutrition quickly. Uh, I know like in swap, you guys are all very big on like, you know, you, you talk about your rest days in terms of like what the food you're going to eat is <laughs> so, so yeah. like, you yeah. know, taco Tuesday or burritos or whatever it might be. Um, so what do you generally tell, um, athletes about nutrition, like in terms of how they should fuel themselves? Absolutely. Yeah. So nutrition is an interesting topic because I think there are so many different ways that you can go about nutrition and um, different philosophies are almost like religion. You know what I mean? It's like there's, there's very passionate people about um, different elements of nutrition. In SWAP, we just try to keep it simple. We emphasize that athletes should eat a wide variety of foods. Um, it's the best way to feel your body. It's the best way for nutrition to be delicious. Um, and then for most athletes, particularly athletes who are training hard or who are in bigger blocks of training, just emphasize that getting in enough is the most important thing. So um, I work with a lot of female athletes who don't get in enough um, calories. And sometimes in those situations, you know, you can lose your menstrual cycle, you can have negative effects on bones and same for male athletes with low energy availability. So just making sure athletes are getting in enough and getting in a wide variety of foods. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like not skimping on the, the extras. Yeah. And just keeping it fun. We try to, we try to highlight taco Tuesday and pizza Wednesday and bagel Thursday and all these different things just because eating should be fun. And especially when you're training hard, eating can be really fun. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I don't know. I, I think it's true for majority of ultra runners that the, one of the main reasons that they do ultras is because of the um, aid stations. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% so agree. And yeah. I think, I think athletes, honestly, who are most successful at ultras are athletes who are able to have an eating fest out there on the course. Um, and, yeah. you know, there's different philosophies in terms of being fat adapted and different ways to get at ultras. But um, the athletes who I've seen most successful at ultras, especially in the long term and especially consistency or consistently are athletes who just eat crap tons out there. Yeah. And you having the stomach to be able to manage that too is really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is important. And that's something that um, can be trained over time. So I think working in foods into long runs, like not being, a, not being, um, 
you know, essentially fueling those long runs with the exact fuel that you're going to use on race day is it trains the body, it trains the, um, you know, it changes the stomach to, to digest things. Yeah, for sure. Um, and another one is obviously uh, Swap has a lot of ultra runners and trail runners in it, right? Um, but you guys also coach people who train on the road primarily, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what is your, like, how do you think trail running can help? Do you get your road runners to run on trails? And what do you think trail running does for a runner? Yeah, trail running is great in terms of thinking about the athleticism of an athlete. So the ability to move over rocks, the ability to run up and down hills um, helps build the overall athleticism of a runner. And that's something that's both fun and valuable in terms of longevity. It's also great for injury prevention. Again, you're not, you don't have those, um, there's repeated movement patterns, which could put you at higher risk on the roads, depending on what type of runner you are. I think the one, the one concern is that trails can make you slower if you're not prioritizing speed, um, if you're not prioritizing um, the biomechanics. And so what we encourage for anyone who is a road runner who is also doing trails is just to stay in touch with that speed. Um, mm -hmm. And then the transition from being a roadrunner to trails is actually easier because you just have to work in a few trail days, get used to that neuromuscular movement of running over rocks and roots and things like that. Yeah, yeah. One thing I, I definitely think trail running is a good way to train your body as more holistically. You know, like if you're not necessarily someone who's keen to go to the gym or, you know, do a lot of like structured strength training, then trail running in some ways can be like a free way of getting like some extra training on like your core muscles and stabilizing muscles and just like all the extra muscles that you don't necessarily use when you're just going forward and back right yeah absolutely i think it just builds into the athleticism of being an athlete the other thing i, I was actually just having a conversation with a strength coach about this uh power hill strides are also a great way to build um the foundation of strength um the the strength coach that i was talking to actually said you know really powerful athletes are essentially doing um low level plyometrics when they're doing hill strides and so um it's nice to think about that as as adding another layer of athleticism to training yeah yeah for sure so um just quickly on that, how do you guys approach um, strength? Do you generally prescribe strength training to everybody or is it like as, a, as an ease basis and how could you fit that into someone's schedule? Yeah, strength training is, is actually another controversial topic. It's kind of like uh, nutrition. You Google it and you get all kinds of exciting things that pop up as it relates to running and all kinds of opinions. I personally really like strength training for athletes. I think it's great for, again, establishing that musculoskeletal system. For female athletes, it's great for building bones. And I also just think, again, it's fun. It gets at being an athlete. I mean, really building that holistic athlete. What we recommend to most of our athletes, David actually has what he calls the eight minute mountain legs routine um, on a Trail Runner Magazine article. And it's a basic routine that can be done in eight minutes, um, really works the glutes, the hamstrings, um, the overall hip strength um, without being overwhelming. I think the big thing I see for athletes is that trying to think about working in a 60 minute strength plan into the overall context of training is just, it's just a lot for people. And so having something that's, that's easily done and consistent is better than trying to shoot for the moon. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, David has a lot of really great resources and I think basically everything that we've talked about today, David's probably written a trail runner magazine article about it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try, I'll try and link a few of them down below in the description for the video um, as well. Um, do you, I think I've run out of questions. Um, do you have anything else that uh, we haven't touched on that you think would be uh, useful to touch on or? Yeah, I think we've touched on this briefly kind of in the, the mental side of things. For me right now with a lot of athletes, given the COVID-19 situation, I'm just encouraging a lot of people to think about a sense of play when training. Um, so to come at this from an element of like, how can I really enjoy what I'm doing and create a lasting approach um, for that joy. And so I'm encouraging athletes to try all kinds of different things like now, like right now, like listening to music, um, going on kind of like DIY adventure routes, um, mm. you know, just getting creative with training and, and see what happens and, and see how it, how it changes your relationship with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, definitely something that I've been I don't even know if I've done it intentionally, but I've been doing a lot more exploring lately. <laughs> it's like, fun. Yeah. yeah. Just going there's and finding new trails. There's something powerful about getting lost. I think the other element of play too is just knowing yourself. So 
it's like for a really data driven athlete like you, um, I can see play being like working with new gadgets or trying new form techniques or, um, you know, really like delving into the science element of it. So kind of taking a broad scope of what play is and thinking about who you are as a person and what your personality is and, and how that fits into it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've, I've obviously been um, making the most of no races on the calendar to, um, to do a lot more physio and like try and nail out the, uh, the things that I haven't paid attention to that maybe need some attention in terms of my running. So, yeah, uh, I think you're right though. Like overall, you know, we all run primarily just because we enjoy it. So, you know, we want to maximize our enjoyment and make sure that we're having fun and not getting too bogged down. It's hard to, I guess there's nothing really too much to focus on at the moment. So we can just focus on just having fun. Exactly. Yeah. And seeing how that can be sustainable and how you can stay competitive with that mindset. So I tell athletes, if you can go do a workout and, you know, hit some pretty high heart rates and, um, you know, put out some good threshold work and still have fun, that's kind of like the pinnacle of running. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, so uh, what about you? Have you got any um, things on the horizon? Like how are you kind of like mo staking out your, your plan for, for the current, you know, outlook? I'm excited. So I'm recovering right now from, well, I'm, I'm actually past the recovery phase. I'm back to 100%. But a year ago, um, almost today, I ruptured my high hamstring and had surgery. So it's been basically a full year of rehab and getting back to it, but I'm back at full mileage, back at full intensity. So next time there's a race on the calendar, sign me up. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm, just, I'm really excited to get out there and be competitive again. Yeah, nice. And I noticed you've got a mountain bike and been doing some mountain bike exploring too. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about my injury is I've, I've found a love of biking through this process. So I was actually told that I may never return to competitive running again. So briefly considered becoming a professional cyclist, or at least trying to dabble in, dabble in it, despite my terrible descending habits. Um, so yeah, it's been fun. I've been mountain biking and gravel biking and using that as a good way to cross train and build strength. Yeah. Yeah. Mountain biking. I think mountain biking is the cycling version of trail running, obviously. And uh, it's, they seem to attract the same kinds of people and it's like the same kind of a, a attitude, which is really awesome. Like it's a really fun thing to do. It's hard. It's actually, it's man, it's, it's really hard. It's funny when I'm mountain biking, there's like a, I have a valid concern at all times. I might break my neck. So it makes, it makes <laughs> trail running feel, you know, with trail running, I feel like I might break my ankle, which kind of pales in comparison to mountain biking. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, uh, I, think, I think I'll be respectful of your time and we can wrap it up there. But before we wrap it up, um, are there any resources that you can point to in terms of people finding out more about SWAP and you and David and, and just generally like what's going on that might be helpful to them and staying in touch? I think the most important resource is our dog actually has an Instagram. So our dog is, oh, Addie yeah. Stuff, which is, it's kind of, it's technically David and Addie, but she's a voice of reason and hopefully a source of joy um, during these uncertain times. Um, I'm also on Instagram and post random pictures of bikes and running at Meg runs happy. And then we have a swap running website. So it's swaprunning.com. And we plan to go through and categorize um, some of David's trail running articles to be there as a resource. And then this is breaking, somewhat breaking news. It's not really that exciting, but we may be starting a podcast. So stay tuned. Oh, that is exciting. I'm yeah, excited. yeah. We're, we just got podcast equipment. So we'll see, we'll see what happens once we start recording. I was wondering if you guys would ever start broadcasting anything because you've got so much to share and like, it seems like Swap is constantly running at capacity. So... Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're going with it. We're going to try like a 30 to 45 minute podcast where we just highlight five key points, maybe receive some questions from SWAT members and other community members and make some jokes. Probably make nice. fun of David in the process. So it'll be good. Cool. Um, all right. Well, I guess where will they, where will people, people be able to find out about that if it happens and when it happens? We will post that on social media and then also on our SWAT running website. So swaprunning.com. Nice. Okay. That's amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Megan, for your time. And um, it's been great chatting to you. And uh, there's a wealth of wisdom here. So I hope that people find this and uh, digest some of the, uh, the knowledge that you've, uh, you've shared, because uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. This was, this was so much fun. I really appreciate it. And I'm just grateful for the content that you're putting out there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm doing my best. I'm just doing it because I love it. And obviously, want to get as many people running for as long as possible. That's so awesome. And everybody should go and read your book, The Happy Runner, because it basically contains all of the wisdom that we've just talked about. So. 
Oh, thank you. It also gives a much more accurate description of the training salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You probably you probably went over that one a couple times more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. Thank you very much, Megan. And uh, I will uh, speak to you in the logs. Awesome. Have a good one. This was really fun. You too. Okay. Take care. Take care. Well, hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, it's my intention to do more of these with uh, whatever experts I can find. And uh, the next one plans to be with my good friend, Margie, who is a physio. She's an ex uh, state champion, 800 meter runner, and now a sub 245, I think, marathon runner. Uh, but she's an expert in running and running injuries because that's what she treats every day yeah so hopefully that'll be good and there'll be more like that in the future as well so stay tuned and thanks for popping by <laughs>